Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome you all for this uh, uh, evening's lecture on uh, hydrodynamics of beach placer deposits <clears throat> and the sustainable exploitation uh, by Dr. T. N. Prakash. <clears throat> Doctor, uh, let me just introduce the speaker to all of you. Uh, I have uh, the pleasure of introducing Dr. T. N. Prakash. Um, who is a long associate. I had a very, very long associate association with Dr. Prakash. <clears throat> um, and uh, he is uh, retired just last year as a scientist G, and he was a former uh, director of Cent National Center for Earth Sciences at Trivandrum, and <clears throat> was also a group head in the Coastal Processes Group. <clears throat> he had uh, worked right from his uh, initial years uh, on the beach and the near shelf uh, hydrodynamics. Uh, his uh, main area was uh, uh, in the Quelan coast, which uh, also um, is very famous for the uh, black sands <clears throat> accumulation, which are uh, used for uh, uh, thorium and other uh, extraction processes. <clears throat> Uh, he had worked on the Ashtamudi Kayar, uh, that is an estuarine zone located uh, in the Quelan coast, and had uh, uh, developed a management plan for the Ashtamudi Lake uh, in uh, collaboration with the group from New Zealand. <clears throat> uh, he had worked on the hydrodynamics of uh, beaches of Lakshadweep for a very, very long time, maybe about uh, 15 years or so, he worked continuously uh, in Lakshadweep also. <clears throat> he has executed many uh, research projects uh, of DST and other such agencies and had been a member of several state and uh, central committees and uh, has published uh, around 50 research publication, has to his credit two field guide notebooks and many technical reports. He has also co-authored a book on geomorphology and physical oceanography of the Lakshadweep coral islands uh, in the Indian Ocean uh, by Springer. He has participated in several offshore cruises and has presented uh, papers in several international and national conferences. <clears throat> um, he is also a mentor for the DST inspire scholars. Um, currently, he is uh, working as a senior consultant uh, of the Ministry of Environment, uh, Ministry of uh, Earth Sciences at uh, Center for Earth Science Studies. I have pleasure in inviting Dr. T. N. Prakash to deliver today's uh, talk on uh, hydrodynamics of beach placer deposits. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much. Yeah, you can start the delivery of lecture. You can share your. Yes, thank, thank you very much, Dr. Prithviraj, for the nice uh, introduction. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank uh, Manipal uh, Academy of Higher Education for uh, giving me an opportunity to share some of the work which is very dear to me. I will uh, straight away go to the, my presentation uh, in a one minute time. Yes, straight away I will go to the topic of uh, today evening presentation. Uh, hydrodynamics of beach placer deposits and their sustainable exploitation, the way forward. Uh, my structure of the talk will be like this. I will give a brief introduction about beach placers, their history and how mining is being carried out and 
the concentration along the beaches, how it uh, enriches on the beaches, and also the spatial and temporal variation. And also, I will be covering the impact of beach sand mining. So when you mine the beach for these kind of minerals, you are going to create a serious uh, uh, you know, anthropogenic activity that is beach erosion. Uh, that is a very serious hazard. I think as you know, even in uh, uh, Karnataka coast, I think you have a beautiful beaches around uh, 3, 10 kilometer long coastline. Uh, I just want to share uh, the work which has been carried out recently on shoreline management plan for Karnataka 2020. I think this is uh, from the Asian Development Bank assistant with government of Karnataka. I think it is a beautiful work. I think you should, uh, one of my colleague, uh, Dr. Kurian, was former director and he was our uh, head also. So he, he, he coordinated this whole activity for minimum two years period. And this is a wonderful masterpiece work. I think uh, Karnataka beaches have lovely beaches. I think you don't see that kind of beaches anywhere in uh, other place. I think Kerala already has spoiled because beach will be good if it is, you don't put any hard structure on that. Particularly when you see in Kerala, you have almost uh, after 560 kilometer coastline, you have almost uh, two third has been covered by the sea wall. I think that is an ugly structure. I think Karnataka coast, I think it is a pristine. I think you have a lot of beaches. I think you have not spoiled it. I think uh, the work which I just mentioned, I think it is a just a marvelous work to tell that not to spoil the beach by putting the hard uh, solution to that. I think they have suggested many structure. I don't want to go into detail. And then the topic which I will be covering that is the inertial deepening. When the beach erosion happens, so you will uh, artificially the deepening the near shore areas and their process involved. And I will also cover a case studies taking uh, about the beach mining, how it is being done. And uh, I will cover a little bit uh, how sustainable uh, mining can be done, provided you take care of that and the way forward. This is my structure of the talk. I just would like to give uh, a brief introduction. I think uh, you all might have gone to the beach and see the beaches, right? So when you go to the beach, you see the white sand. White sand is nothing but the silica rich sand, a quartz, which has a density of around 2.57. But what I'm talking today is the placer minerals. Placer minerals are also in colloquial way, you call it a black sand. It looks like black. So you please observe when you go on to the beach, whether you have a white sand beach or a black sand beach are there. When you take on to the to your hand and see it, you have different type of minerals. So I just listed in that, I will come back to that. And these minerals are formed by the process of weathering, transportation and deposition uh, in the river meanders. In the way I said river meanders, I think river, when it is flowing in the strait, I think energy is very high. But when you have a meander, what happens? The energy is little lower. So these minerals are denser. It tries to accumulate on the river meanders. And the estuary, the coastal base, and of course, the beach environment, which we are talking today. In India, beach sand minerals or heavy sands form the important place the deposits compared to gold and other such minerals. When I say place the gold, I think we don't have that in Africa, South Africa, we have a uh, place the gold deposition are there in that. But in the river, of course, you, you may you get a little bit uh, gold also in the river uh, beach sediments, in the river sediments. So when I'm talking about place the minerals, I just listed about uh, magnetite, monazite, Illuminate, zircon, rutile, garnet, and silimonite. And these are all the heavy minerals, which has density range from 3.3 to 5.1. So anything less than quartz is the pure sand, uh, quartz rich sand is around 2.57. But all these minerals are uh, you know, strategically and industrially very useful mineral for a lot of application. I will tell one example. Illuminate is a mineral which is a composition called uh, FeTiO2, iron and titanium dioxide. 
So TiO2 is the one titanium, I think is the future steel, which is a very light steel and very, you know, very hard and uh, many aircraft, you know, whatever the, it is there. So they use the titanium steel and then titanium bad side they use for all the painting industries and zircon, of course, which is a very industrially usable, they use for in the furnace to close it and rutile, it is a pure form of, you don't have iron, it is uh, pure of titanium dioxide, TiO2 and garnet and uh, silimerate. Garnet they use called in uh, memory and emery paper, you just rubbing paper, I think they use for garnet and silimerate once again, it is a abrasive material, they use it. And coming back to the history, how uh, these minerals have been identified? So initial discovery was in 1909 uh, in the erstwhile coast of uh, Travancore, where uh, our Kerala is the Kerala coast. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, you are. Uh, Pardon me. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Only this uh, slide slide has to be swapped. Uh, slide has become. I mean, you are not able no, to it see is, the. No, it's all right. No, no, no. You have to. Uh, the presentation has to come forward. We are not able to see the presentation. Only. Is it possible? No, it is there. Ah, now it's come. Yeah, now it's come. Yeah. I think and light I, probably is it. Light is I the. Don't, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Now, now it's is okay. it all right? Okay. Now it is all right. Yes. Yes, it's fine. Fine. Okay. Go ahead. Please. I will continue about it. So as I said about that, the initial discovery was in 1909 in the estuary of Travancore uh, coast, uh, the Kerala. Uh, how it has been, you know, identified uh, is, you know, as you know that Kerala is the land of uh, coconuts. I think from coconut we called as Kalpa Ruksha in Kannada. So it is all the material from the coconut is used. You know, they make ask fiber out of it, and they used to export to different countries. From the uh, from Kerala, when they export this coir, uh, it has gone to Germany, and there I think they found this is some mineral which is very you know uh, uh, shining and it is a little uh, golden color. They found that it is a monazite. So when they traced it from where it has come, they traced to the Kerala southwest coast of India. So that time this monazite, you know, as you know that it has a it is a radioactive mineral which has uranium and thorium also is there and in, in addition to that we have a lot of uh, rare earth uh, elements like uh, cerium, lanthanum and all uh, uh, these things, rare earth elements. But that time this thorium nitride from monazite, it is a chemically produced from monazite was a in great demand for production of mantle for gas lights. I think that time, I think even uh, electricity was not there. I think they used to use the gas lights. I think they used to use thorium nitrate, you know, the uh, extra material from the monazite. So that's how, you know, these minerals get uh, industrially, you know, useful. With the advent of electricity and demand for gas lights, you know, diminished. But uh, uh, the rest of the deposits also, you know, as I told you earlier, uh, these uh, minerals like uh, illuminate and all, which has the titanium uh, rich uh, mineral, which are also useful for many industrially useful minerals. So that's how, you know, people interest has started. In 1930 to 35, a number of foreign and Indian uh, uh, entrepreneurs have started, you know, companies in uh, India, particularly on the uh, southwest coast of India. But uh, in 1955-60, many companies, you know, which have started has to close down due to market pressure and uh, management and, uh, and the labor issues. And uh, that time, Indian Rarers Limited, which is part of Atomic Energy Department, I uh, know Atomic Energy Department has started IREL. They took over this company in 1960s and then started exploiting these deposits uh, in uh, Kerala and as well as in Manamala Kurchis in Tamil Nadu. So when you look into the scenario of world placers, as of now, India is reportedly contributed only 5% of the global production, even though it has around 16% of the global resources of these minerals. But the need of the hour is the 
sustainable exploitation without causing much damage i think that is what you know the key point uh, which i would like to stress that so as you see it here um, many areas in even in the africa you have many deposits and then uh, uh, even in australia and then new zealand i think you have uh, you know in the world scenario i think you have many areas uh, place that deposits are exist there so which uh, you know india is also you know contributing uh, to their uh, this thing uh, product coming back to the in indian uh, when i am talking about uh, in india where all these deposits occur in uh, when you see it the west coast of india uh, you have uh, ratnagiri which has a fairly good deposit but it has not been exploited but and then another is you know which i said in uh, kerala that is chavra deposits which is one of the famous deposits why i said it is famous this uh, uh, ilmenite uh, you know which has uh, titanium content in that fetio2 but titanium uh, percentage is almost 60% in uh, chavra deposit i think that is a very significant see you don't get in any other uh, part of the uh, deposits that much quality of uh, now illuminate in that and then coming back to other uh, one more area which is called manavala kurchi which is uh, uh, southern side and uh, from kanyakumari it is around uh, uh, 50 km north of uh, uh, kanyakumari manavala kurchi that is also very uh, fairly good deposit these two deposits are being mined from 1960 onwards another area in the in the uh, southeast area is kudrai moli that is called inland terry deposits it is uh, it is not on the beach it is mostly rest on the dune deposits another area is uh, near andhra, andhra pradesh visakhapatnam area that is also not been exploited and it is only been assessed and then another area uh, in orissa uh, that is chatrapur and which is uh, been uh, exploited but uh, uh, recently you know because here it is more of magnetite content is there but you compared to other uh, two deposits you are magnetite rich uh, deposit in chatrapur that so that has little bit problem for separation and all this thing i don't want to go into much details so coming back to the uh, the the concentration or the deposit amount i say illuminate forms the largest constituent of the indian beach deposits it roughly around 3 348 million tons followed by silimanite 120 million tons garnet 10107 metric million tons zircon is only around 21 million tons and rutile 18 million this is what you know source from uh, atomic mineral division source from that data what i was just talking to you is just you know the chavra deposit how good the deposit is where it occurs you see this how uh, the uh, the beach you can see it is a black we call black sand deposits so you see here another one more but company what they do it they whatever comes on the beach during the fair weather period or during the all seasons they scoop it and take it to the factory to separate you know based on the density minerals so i just wanted to draw your attention here so i think uh, dr prithviraj when he was introducing to, uh, you know um, to me uh, he was talking about uh, astamodi estuary this is an uh, estuary second largest estuary in kerala after the vemanad lake which is a very vast uh, lake uh, for and uh, when you see here sorry the this uh, inlet to another uh, one more inlet called koyankulam it is 22 km it is a barrier beach barrier beach means you have a one side a sea another side is a lake so we call as a barrier beach this barrier beach houses the chavra deposits and uh, this is what uh, you know i just said about manavala kurchi which is uh, north of kanyakumari 50 km and you see the concentration of uh um, place some minerals here and here one significant uh, uh, 
you know, deposit, you know, in this uh, area is monazite even up to 1% it occurs in this deposit, Madawala Kurchi. It has a garden uh, uh, monazite. And this is what I said about Terry Dunes deposit. And here also, you know, a lot of minerals it gets, you know, here you can see here. Uh, it uh, follows there. And uh, how, where, where it, uh, how it uh, originates these places? Probably you all know the rocks, inland rocks, we call rocks is nothing but aggregate of minerals, which has all minerals are there in that. So it is linked to the parent rock on the Western Ghat mountain regions. But the source, I just say few rock types, you called as condolite. Condolite, it contains garnite, silimonite, major composition is there in that condolite rock. That's why when it uh, weather, these minerals gets into the river and then river brought into the sea. And then once again, it, uh, the hydrodynamic process works there and bring back to the, to, to the beach. Another charnakite, nice and granite. I think you all know granite. I think Karnataka is known for granite. Very, it is a, is a igneous body which come from the mantles directly. And then of course, laterite is another one more uh, sedimentary rock, which is also contributing that. The weather mineral grains transported to the rivers and estuaries and inshore region. The formation of placer occurs due to sorting process. As I said, sorting, why? What is sorting? Sorting is nothing but because you have a density difference of 2.57 to 5.5 when it goes. I think this is what you know, density works. And then the hydrodynamic process, when I say hydrodynamic forces, that waves and currents acts on it, on the sediments, and gets slowly enriched onto the beach. I will be just showing to you how it gets enriched, what all the process involved in that, I will just cover in the next slides. These are all the you know, sorting process. When I say settling equivalence, Settling equivalence is nothing but you have contrasting density, one heavy minerals which has a wavy denser and very finer grain. Another one more which is a, which is a bigger one and it is a lighter mineral. But these two settling velocity is different. So I think that makes a difference in uh, sorting. And then another one more entrainment equivalence, which you know normally when uh, wave act on these uh, sediments of both minerals. The, uh, the, the lighter minerals, which is the denser, less denser minerals, it move much faster and then denser one will stay back. I think uh, when you look into the, the third uh, part C, transport equivalent, this is very significant in the near shore areas. When waves, nothing but, you know, it is a oscillatory motion of uh, uh, the water uh, column and uh, at the crest of the wave, the, the energy will be much uh, higher compared to the trough. At the crest, what happens when, uh, when the sediment is there, uh, it moves much faster towards the shore, lighter minerals move, move fast, faster rather than the denser one. So that's why, you know, at the, in the bed load, this difference transporting uh, transport sorting takes place and that's how it gets enrichment. Another uh, very important, the D1, it is the shear sorting you can see on the beach face. When you walk on the beach, you see the waves comes and breaks and then waves takes the sediments up and then once again energy ceases and it goes back. When you, when you keep watching, See, the minerals, you know, it'll, because of this sheer sorting of uh, waves, it gets sorted out. The denser one, uh, it will be stay on the top and slowly the lighter minerals moves towards the breaking area. I think these are all the, some of the uh, settling sorting uh, uh, processes I just uh, mentioned to you. And then uh, this, I just wanted to show two figures of in Chavara and Manavala Kurchi, how it gets concentrated you can see here the Chavra area almost, you know, enrichment factor, it, even if it goes up to five, and then Manavala Kurchi is around, uh, uh, even there also four to five enrichment factor is there. That means that much concentration slowly gets onto the B. 
beach area. So this is what you know you, you can see it here. People are uh, pulling. You know I will just tell you in the next slides what they are doing is because we are measuring the depth in the breaking area because this is a very difficult when waves come from the offshore and breaks. It is very difficult. You cannot stand. So how do you measure the depth? So we are uh, taking the slit profile of the near shore profile by pulling the you know uh, the scale is there. This is the scale. Are you scale? And then you know we will be watching with the dumpy level and take the measurement there. And this is the scenario. I just wanted to show uh, an example here. Uh, in the 1980s, if you have almost 60 to 80 concentration, you can see on the uh, uh, on the yeah, y-axis uh, heavy mineral concentration, and you have the stations. These are all the stations. So when you see here, almost 60 to 80 percent concentration used to get it in this Chaura uh, area, but. Of late, I think that concentration has reduced. I will just tell how tsunami also has affected their concentration on the this uh, coast. And this is just I just wanted to show the heavy mineral concentration in the uh, in the um, inner shelf area. In 1987, when you when I sh earlier in the uh, uh, previous figures, I showed you Chaura coast. In 1987, in the offshore area, uh, around 17% concentration was there. In 1997, it reduced to 12. And then in 2005, it is in the offshore area, even if you go up to 30, 40 meter depth, the concentration is 2%. So you can imagine why it has in 2005, the concentration of heavy minerals in the surfacial sediment has reduced. As you know, in 2004, I think, uh, tsunami struck in December 26. I think that has you know, brought a catastrophic change in the near shore areas and even the concentration of these minerals have reduced you know, in, the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the inner shelf area and that has affected even in the beach, the concentration, whatever it is there, it come from the offshore area. And in 2012, slowly we have made a estimation that he, uh, uh, because of the sorting process and the material went from the river or the estuary, slowly the concentration has increased to even up to 8%. See, now I just mentioned to you the scenario of, of uh, the, uh, the, these minerals occurs on the beach. Uh, the, when you take these uh, minerals for your uh, benefit, and for, for industrial application, what it causes? It causes severe uh, beach erosion. So normally what they do is they scrap the beach face as it when it comes onto the beach and uh, you know, they take onto the, uh, this thing. So it causes severe uh, uh, beach erosion or coastal erosion. As I think in India, coastal erosion is a very serious problem along the coast because as you know uh, the density of population who lives you know very high particularly when i talk about the area which i told you that uh, area even up to 4000 people per square kilometer i think one of the thickest population coastal population lives in this quailan uh, coast area the one of the basic principle is where the sand removal exceeds the sand deposition what will happen it, uh, it, it is a negative impact, it causes the erosion. You take excess sand, whatever you know it is coming from the uh, offshore area, so you are causing. So uh, one estimation, uh, we made one cubic meter of sand trapped by a structure. When I say about structure, I was just uh, telling you, I think probably you all go to the beach sometimes, probably, I don't know, now I think after the COVID, uh, uh, situation now slowly. I think government has allowed people to go to the beach. I think you will be visiting Malpe or uh, Marwante beach. I think even beautiful beach. So I think uh, there, I think you may see some structures. I think, you know, uh, in Mangalore, I think they might have built, uh, you know, 
fort area they build a breakwater there is a breakwater so this you know breakwater as any coastal structure it uh, you know stops the sediment movement so that way 1 cubic meter of sand trapped by a structure or removed from the beach system is equal to 1 cubic meter of erosion somewhere else if you remove or prevent a movement of sediment in one area you are creating a artificial you somewhere else in the other area so another very interesting is the inertial deepening when i said about inertial deepening means the sediment has to come from the uh, offshore area when you keep removing what will happen the slowly the depth increases so you are creating a deepening in the inertial area so to understand all these things so we need to know the budgeting how much sediments are coming from the different sources and then we need to budget it i think probably how much safely you can take the sediment without causing damage to the environmental area and without causing the coastal erosion you need to take that how to do this i think it is a simple i think i will uh, profit and loss i just uh, show table here i list about a profit in one side and a loss profit is all the long shore transport on shore transport the uh, sediment coming from the river the wind transport beach nourishment cliff erosion these are all the profit when i say about loss long shore transport see uh, the uh, out of the area offshore transport i will just tell you a few example in the coming slides what means offshore transport i will be just uh, telling in the pictorial uh, representation wind transport these are all the you know profit and loss see i just you know show to you uh, this is a schematic diagram so i just show the inner shelf inner shelf you know it ranges from 8 to 10 meters in that area and then you have a near shore zone surf zone and the beach this is the you know normally glacier what happens in the inner shelf the sand from the offshore it comes to the near shore zone and it moves you know on and off anything which comes to the shore to the beach we call as the on shore transport anything which goes back to the offshore it is called the offshore transport so in the inner shell what happen these two on shore offshore will be happening but in the near shore zone what will happen the sediment mostly when it comes to near shore zone it will transfer on to the beach it will just gets welded to the beach so welds on to the beach means when you see during different seasons like we have a monsoon season i think you all experience in mangalore i think monsoon is severe may june july august during that time wave activity is very high so the uh, the spatial temporal variation of the beach also changes during that time when energy is very high the beach width will be very less because not much sediment will be coming on to the beach during the fair weather season when i say fair weather season during the most post monsoon period that is the period normally beach builds up the sediment from the near shore zone because wave will be very ideal uh, time it slowly comes on to the surf zone and then it gets on to the beach that's why during november december beach will be wide i think you know i think probably i just would like to tell one example how the severe erosion a structure built as cost you know in mangalore i think ullal i think uh, ullal summer sand beach i think you know probably i when i was also in about 35 years back 40 years back when i was in mangalore we all used to go and enjoy the beautiful beach i think what had happened they built a you know a breakwater to in the south of uh, ullal what had happened it has trapped most of the sediments south of it and then it was no sediment was coming to someshwar ullal and it has you know severely eroded now i think there is some intervention has happened i think that as i think you can see it i think it has uh, i think our own group has done that i think now slowly the beach has you know started forming in the ullal beach 
I just, uh, you know, prior to the previous slide, I just showed you near uh, inner shell, near shore, surf and breakwater. Normally in the inner shell, if the sediment, if it is coming, if there is a cross shore flex, we call it as a cross shore flex, if it is there, if it is not there, it is, if it is not there, and then along shore also, if it is not there, if you remove the sand, what will happen? You are, you know, creating a severe erosion. I think this, this is one case study. If you don't have any sediment coming from the offshore, and then there is no transfer of sediment along shore, you are, if you take a sediment, you are creating a huge, you know, a vacuum, and then creating a, you know, severe erosion on the beach. What will happen? You have a, you don't have sediment coming from the offshore, but you have, of course, you have a longshore current, which, you know, normally the, it is all wave induced current. It brings, you know, substantial sediment <coughs> along shore, along shore. And then if you take little bit, I think, you know, you are a little bit, you know, creating a imbalance not much severe erosion in the in the third case is ideal you have a sediment coming from the inner shelf area and then you have a longshore drift we call longshore current that also brings substantial amount of uh, sediments onto the beach if you have this situation i think it is very ideal to take uh, you know any you know amount of sediment from the beach i think it is a very ideal i think you will not get this kind of ideal situation in the in the given coast this is one of the i just would like to show a case study which i just previously showed you the chawra deposits and then uh, here that barrier beach has you know rich concentration in that and we made a, you know, uh, three studies in 1999 onwards, we did a study in this uh, area, 2002, in collaboration with uh, New Zealand, uh, we did it, and then University of Waikato. And then in 2010 and 12, we did another, you know, as I said, there was a drastic, uh, you know, reduction in the heavy mineral concentration on the beach. We did the budget in 2019-99-2002. Uh, and then in uh, 2010, there was a drastic reduction from 60%. I think uh, not even 10 to 15% concentration was there. So that was the scenario of how a tsunami has affected even the coastal resources. And then in 2019, we did it uh, last uh, year of impact of beach mining on the Chavara because there was a serious question mark on these companies because they were exploiting the much more than what was suggested to them in uh, 1999. I think the government, you know, took a decision to approach us. I think we did that study in 2019. I will just show a few examples of that. How did we approach this? What, you know, as I said, sediment budgeting, excuse me. The approach is, one is field measurements and the hydrodynamic measurement and then other uh, sedimentological means all the sediments we need to take it into consideration and then we did the numerical modeling of hydrodynamic process and arrive at the how the sediment transport is there in this area for this see we need a any uh, measure you need a systematic measurement to do that, I will just uh, give a scheme of instrumentation which we did it during that time. So we need a instrumentation called wave radar bar. It measures the waves. We deployed at 20 meters, and uh, this is offshore site around uh, 8 to 10 meters. Inshore site it is around 5 meter. So we put uh, current meters, water sampler, sediment traps. So as I said, 8 and 5 meter significance is inner shell and near shore and then the subzone and in the subzone we have put a video camera and then anything uh, animograph to measure the wind and then we established the field station these are all the just to give a glimpse about how you know very seriously we, we want to do it we need a good uh, instrument measurement is required to do that 
So based on the, all this uh, instrumentation measurements, we computed the how much onshore flux is coming onto this beach. We estimated around 53 meter cube per year, and then offshore flux we estimated 44 meter cube per year, and then longshore flux we did it, and then we come out with a model we call the step ladder uh, model to how it is getting concentrated and that as i said the uh, the coastal current which is normally in the inner shelf area is mostly driven by wind wind you know acts on the sea and that is the current draws there and then the other current as i said longshore current that is the current which is Wave, indu wave induced means you know wave come wave at waves comes from different angles during the you may be observing during the monsoon period it is normally come from southwest direction and then during the other period the wave direction changes during the different season so this uh, longshore current is driven by the wave and because of these uh, differential one is in the south another is putting on the south because of this zigzag you call it the step ladder concept because slowly the minerals get enriched onto the uh, chavra coast i think this is what we published in the journal of coastal research what it do i just would like to give step ladder concept it is a, it is called it is a sedimentary system to understand that we have come out with that and this is the uh, like a counter, one is acting another side, another is moving up. I think these two, you know, of uh, different direction makes, you know, uh, the concentration, you know, in the particularly in the Chavra area. Once you understand this uh, concept, I think we'll be able to, uh, you know, uh, appreciate the, the budgeting and then even uh, about the concentration, why it is, you know, the concentration has reduced. As I said, since uh, in 2001, the mining scenario changed because you know in 2001, I think uh, two companies started mining much more what we had given in 1999, and the intake was you know uh, exceeding the annual replenishment from the offshore area, and uh, the dynamic equilibrium was upset because the equilibrium of this coast has upset because you know people you know the two companies started mining much more than what we suggested. See, you can see here the shoreline position. We have just in 1968, the lowest one at the offshore area, the red one. Now, this is what the scenario of Chavra coast here. It has caved in. In 2020, almost 400 to 500 meter from 1968, when you see it, 500 half a kilometer coast as you know, eroded into this because, you know, you have mined exceedingly what it was uh, not uh, permitted. So these are all, you know, I just uh, showed different uh, uh, scenario in 2003, how it was there in 2011, 2012, 2013, 14 and 15. So in uh, 2012, people, you know, they already, you know, the seawall was there, existing seawall was there here. I'll just show that. Seawall was there here. And then, you know, th that has been, you know, 500 meter, uh, you know, it has caved in and that much uh, uh, the land part has gone because of excess mining. And this is the scenario I just, uh, we computed the shoreline changes along this coast for different area of different mining sites even up to 8.94 meter per meter per year. I think that was the calculation we did it for this uh, mining uh, sites. So nearly, you know, when you uh, come 1968 to 2019, when you take it, roughly around 400 to 500 meter of uh, land has been eroded in that area. So this is a very, uh, you know, important slide. Just wanted to show how important uh, you know the uh, the measurement in the near shore area breaking area see when waves breaks it it is a uh, very difficult to take measurements so previously you know i just showed you a, a you know profile how you can measure 
a, a near shore profile. So the, the, when you see the figure, the blue one is 2000 uh, profile of the near shore, and then the uh, red one is 2005. When you look into this one, what happened? Up to uh, 1.5 kilometer, you have very rich, you know, what happened? The sediments has been, you know, accreted. That means sediment has moved towards the towards the beach because of tsunami effect in 2004. That much sediment has moved from the offshore to the near shore area. So the profile shows the red profile shows up to 1.5 kilometer huge uh, deposition was there. But in 2010, you can see the other lower uh, profile 2010 and 19 because you have once again started mining and the, whatever sediment which has coming onto the beach, they started mining and you have gone the near shore profile has steepened. So this is just wanted to show that. And this is how you know people were pulling the slack profile, the profile which is you know uh, this is a scale, and then a person will be standing on the beach and will be taking the level measurement of the scale, and that's how we measure it in the breaking area. But behind the breaking area, we use the echo sounder to measure the depth and link the uh, profile. So this is what once again I just. Uh, uh, showing the the near shore bathymetry, how it gets, changes the bathymetric chart 2010 in the left side. And then we have uh, compared the different contours 2015 and 10 contours, how it changes. See the contour, which is the red one, which is the, mm, the one, the latest one, you know, it, it has moved towards the, uh, the show. That means the near shore area has deepened. That means the sediment which was available in the 10 meter contour has moved onto the beach and you have taken away from that. So this is not going to you know, uh, uh, now come back. So this is just to want to show that uh, you know, different uh, bathymetry changes. This is once again the uh, diagram showing the shifting of 2 meter, 5 meter, 10 meter and 15 meter contours in the during different period. I don't want to go into much detail. You just understand uh, when you take the sediment from the beach exceedingly what is coming from the offshore area, you are going to create a deepening of the inner shelf area. I think that is the concept which is. That's just to make a, some uh, you know salient observation whatever I was just talking to you the previously, we need to understand the dynamics of the, the offshore area and then the near shore, inner shell, near shore, subzone and the beach, you need to measure that. What has happened, the quantity of sand which was mined by the companies is much higher than the replenishment from the offshore. As I said, they have taken much more than what is coming in an ideal situation the quantity replenished during the fair weather period is the quantity returned to the offshore during the monsoon period. Normally, when you when you take a season wise, you call that the monsoon period is the period of rainfall, exceedingly rainfall. I think Mangalore, you know, you get a very rainfall in monsoon period. And during the post monsoon period, what happened? You know, the wave activity and even rainfall also reduces. During that period, the beach build process takes place. Because when companies started mining throughout the year, I think you know the sediment uh, what is coming you take away, then you are creating a severe, severely you know erosion. That's how you know even 500 meter it is caving. That, that, that's what it has happened. So what we say about it, intensive beach erosion and caving is, is in the shoreline causes because you are taking the sediment much more than what is coming from the offshore. And one estimation we also give depletion of sand resources in the inner shelf and lowering of the overall level of the shell. See, even the shell level will uh, you know, increase because the depth increases. That means the sediment which was there in the near shore, it has coming onto the beach, you have taken away. That has created a you know, you know, deeper uh, level. So we, one estimation we have said 
uh 68000 we have given will low, uh, we have given a you know sediment to take away uh, to the company and it reduces about 0.1 mm roughly 1 mm every 10 years i think uh, the the level we will reduce by 1 mm so to understand you know the uh, how to make way forward for this the beach sand mining has adverse impact on the beach inertial morphology i think it is very clear from this so any sediment which has coming on the beach if you take without you know you know uh, budgeting or without knowing how much it is coming on to the beach how safely how much you can take it you are going to cause a inertial you know change in the morphological characteristics that is what we need to do that so that means sediment budgeting approach is required sustainability in placer deposit mining can be ensured through sediment budgeting studies as i said earlier the annual intake has to be less than the replenished quantity from the offshore the annual once again i have stress here the annual intake has to be less than the replenished quantity from the offshore i think this is a very clear message i don't want to explain that since the much of the beach erosion problem is man made there is a need to manage the human impact on the beach i think this is you know very clear i think beach erosion is not cause you know if you allow the beach to play its role i think you know it uh, you know the beach will no erosion takes place i think you know the beach builds up during the fair you know fair weather period and you all can go to the beach but if you uh, artificially take away the material i think uh, The, you know you are going to you know create a very in a havoc situation in that area i think this is what i just wanted to i think i am uh, time up i think another uh, i think i took a little bit more time uh, i just uh, with this you know i conclude that i think probably you all uh, visit the beach and then look into that you know how the the beach you know process happening the shear sorting it takes place probably you also look for when you go to the beach you take a sediment and then see it whether there is the black sand or placer minerals are there whether it is a white sand beach i think probably and then these minerals you know as i said whatever minerals which i just mentioned to you these are all very useful minerals all minerals are useful because that's how you know and it has now lot of uh, you uh, know rare earth elements are there which has as you know that i don't want to go into that re has lot of uh, application in the electronic industries and then the, the monazite which is you know we have a very rich concentration which you know thorium reactors i think you know in the coming years probably the r and d which is already you know it is in the in a better scale i think when the thorium reactors are there we have already huge deposits are there but of course we don't have uranium deposits much in this uh, you know in the uh, this thing in the country but uh, thorium is the one which monazite we have a huge stockpile of uh, monazite which you can use for the future energy requirement with this i conclude uh, now my presentation thank you if you have any uh, uh, questions i think i am ready to answer it yeah thank you dr prakash uh does anybody have any questions you are free to kind of <clears throat> i see a lot of students uh geology students earth sciences students also here yes. perhaps some of them could be having some question the kranish are there any So, if there are no questions, uh, I request uh, uh, our director, Dr. Mohini Gupta, to kind of give her views on this uh, uh, lecture, please. Hello. 
Yes, I'm hearing you. <clears throat> Dr. Mohini, are you there? I think she has left. Anyway, uh, I thank you very much for uh, accepting this invitation and coming over and uh, giving this uh, lecture uh, for the benefit of our uh, students here at Mahen. <clears throat> it's been a wonderful uh, experience. Uh, we could see a lot of uh, things that are going on in the beach and near shelf zone, especially in terms of uh, the black sand concentration and its uh, uh, mining and other uh, havoc that it is creating on the environment. Uh, I thank you, Dr. Prakash, for uh, once again for this uh, kind gesture and uh, thank you very much, please. Yes, I once again uh, thank uh, uh, personally Dr. Prithviraj, the Dean Research from uh, MAHI for inviting me to make uh, you know presentation uh, in a very short time. I think, I uh, hope, I think uh, the students uh, probably are uh, benefited. I think probably, I just would like to tell you, you please visit the beach. When you go to the beach, don't just, you know, enjoy the other beauty. Probably you enjoy the waves breaking, how the waves breaking and how, you know, uprush comes, then how the minerals get segregated. Probably you can keep looking for it. Thank you very much. Oh, yes. Thank you. I thank all the students and the staff members of MCNS as well as uh, MIT. Thank you very much. I think we can close the meeting.